Now the gauze being inside caused this massive infection, which had gone upwards, which caused my fallopian tube to be infected. So my left fallopian tube. Eventually, uh, what happened is we started fertility treatments. <clears throat> we started doing our IUIs. During the process of the IUI, during my scan, they saw this very, you know, uh, like a blood-filled tube. So the doctor said, "I think you have an infection," and that's when the first surgery happened. So they went in laparoscopically. They saw that the fallopian tube was full of blood, and she goofed up the second time. So she basically took out the blood and left half of the infected tube inside itself. And it was too late by then for the antibiotics to work because the infection had already started spreading. And so when she went in laparoscopically, ideally to save my life or whatever, she should have taken out the tube because it was infected, right? That would have not caused a further infection. But she left it behind, and uh, she cut off half the tube and left the rest. And this was a relapse again after six months. Again, in the scans, it started showing that there was a cyst, something like a cyst near my ovary. And uh, this is when I panicked and I said something is wrong with the doctor because if someone's had a surgery in one place, you can't have another surgery in the same place in the next six months. That means something has gone wrong. So I took my files. My files are like a huge, big novel. It's like an encyclopedia, like a medical, like a case study. Took my files and went to another doctor. And when they did the scans, he actually took an entire weekend to read my files. He took like the entire Saturday, Sunday. He said, "I need to read through your files." When he did the scan, he said, "Oh, this looks like a normal cyst, like a chocolate cyst, which happens to women in their, you know, uh, fertile years." It happens to all menstruating women. Most women sometimes come up with a chocolate cyst. We said fine. I was admitted, and uh, when they did a blood checkup, my WBC count was like seventeen thousand, and that was above the roof. And I did not look like I was sick. So basically, what happened is, the doctor said I can't perform a surgery on you because you have a very massive infection inside. and so we will postpone this surgery and they started me on antibiotics through iv and uh, my nails started turning blue and that's when they realized that septicemia was like settling in there was like some sort of poisoning happening inside and uh, when they finally set the date because the infection came down a little bit they went into the ot the surgery was 8 hours long it was supposed to be just a 4 or 5 hour surgery because that's how long it takes for a chocolate cyst to be removed turns out that because of this mess up that she did my left ovary was full of blood and it had become the size of a uterus and he basically had to pull out parts of the ovary like bits and pieces in a jar that was a very traumatic surgery because post op i was in a bad shape I, it had taken i think 8 hours for me to handle with like all the you know uh, they had to send like parts of my ovary for biopsy as well because that's another thing they were worried about so when i started to heal and get i got better he said the only option now for you would be ivf because i don't think with one ovary iuis will be successful for you so he said i would suggest that you try at least like maybe one round of ivf and uh, that that's what we did we we did one round of ivf and uh, crazily it worked with that one ovary that i had i got three embryos and uh, all three embryos were planted in and it was a success i had a positive pregnancy test and uh, i was carrying twins one one embryo did not develop so i was carrying twins and uh, somewhere around my and i was like on complete bed rest taking progesterone injections all that somewhere around my uh, 13th 14th week after my scan my water broke so and i lost a, a lot of amniotic fluid and the doctors told me that i would spontaneously miscarry because that's the next step once the body understands that the water has broken the next step is for you to start get into labor but i didn't go into labor for some reason the babies were still growing inside 
and so i was in the hospital for 52 days i was uh, being monitored and i was on iv fluids and they were just trying everything that they could in the textbook to bring my amniotic fluid up and it just didn't happen and at one point i crossed my legal termination date and i was already nearing 26 27 weeks and the doctor said uh, she took my husband to the side and i was like this mom warrior inside you wakes up and you're like come hell or heaven i'm having these babies i don't care this is a very precious pregnancy and uh whatever happens i don't care if i die but these babies will come out and she took my husband aside and said listen she is not thinking from her brain she is thinking from her heart and as her doctor my answer is that her life is always first and i would ask you to sign the papers and go ahead for termination because there is no way she will survive this pregnancy and if i have to tell you the truth this is what she told him is even if the babies do survive this and i'm able to pull them out they will have crushed bones because there is no amniotic fluid because there is nothing for them to move around inside and they are used, they'll be squished because it's called potter syndrome when babies don't have amniotic fluid inside it's very difficult for them to develop their uh, you know their uh, bones properly movement so she said if you if you're okay with this see once the babies are born you can't throw them in the dustbin then they become your responsibility then you have to care for them and considering the medical history we have she said you decide what you want to do do you want to look at lifelong physiotherapy and taking your kids to the doctor and crutches and all kinds of things or if i send her home right now because she is so adamant she will die in the hall if she goes into labor and so with a very 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 heavy heart after sustaining this thing for so long we signed the papers and uh, they sent me back home and they said you know what we have to readmit you in a uh, file number like you can't have your name on record because if it's a girl child then the hospital goes into a legal uh, sort of you know it's legally not right and uh, i was sent home like it was this one last night i had with the babies inside <laughs> so they said go home and come back and come back with like a fresh mind because uh, after being in the hospital for so long it was so nice to sleep on my own bed i had pretty much at that point of time just switched off mentally physically i was numb and people were coming home like you know when someone dies like they come for condolences right they were like holding my hand and sitting with me and i was just i i remember this so well i i can i could not uh register what they were saying to me because the turmoil i was going in like they took me to the scan room and they did a 3d scan so that i could see the babies for one last time they showed me like the spine and the liver and the kidney and all that and uh, so basically i got readmitted and uh, they put this tablet inside you to open the cervix and uh, i had 15 hours of labor and i delivered at around 5 o'clock in the morning and they uh, they asked if i wanted to see the babies and my husband said no and they took it away and i started laughing loudly because i was like finally this is done like the adrenaline rush right i'm i'm this is over like so many months of turmoil and uh, i remember i started bleeding profusely after that my placenta tore because it was infected and pieces of it were coming out so there were like nurses rushing in and out pulling out bed sheets from under me and severe bleeding and uh, at one point the duty nurse she tried to put her hand in to pull out the placenta like the pieces of it right because they were trying to get me to pass it out and that's when i went into like shock and then my pulse severely dipped i was going into cardiac arrest so my pulse was like 3 or 4 and it was like a pit stop like you see this f1 pit stop from like a normal labor room machines opened up and there were like some 10 doctors inside someone's cutting my clothes out i had not taken out any of the metal on my body like i was wearing my nose pin and my earrings because it was supposed to be a normal delivery 
I was wearing my toe rings. All that was taken out, and then they use the they, they defib you. They give you uh, the shock, and uh, somehow brought they gave me the adrenaline injection. I don't remember after this what happened, but I was told, and then they took me to the OT to do a DNC to clean out whatever was there, and and I'm a rare blood type, so they had to bring about six seven units. So I lost more blood than people lose in open heart surgery. so this blood was brought up it was blood transfusion started i was on the ventilator for like 4 days i was in the uh, ccu i was on life support and uh, i was 29 years old and the doctors basically told my husband that uh, she is not going to make it so they were like uh, so what happens is when you when your a uh, family member goes into the cardiac care unit you have to give up your room in the hospital it's a it's the irony of the whole thing you don't get to keep a room because there is no guarantee that they will come back out of it so i remember uh, people coming to see me like it was like the last time they were coming to see me people were taking turns and coming in to see me and uh, i'm a fighter so <laughs> i got came out of it and uh, started breathing on my own was very very weak my hemoglobin was like 3 and uh, i was taken to step down icu and uh, i think i was in step down icu for about a week and i i had a monitor fixed to my arm and they taken like an arterial line because they would keep taking blood every like 15 minutes to check my hemoglobin so when it came up till 8 is when they discharged me and i was in a really really bad shape and i remember all the nurses from the labor room coming and standing around my bed and they had their hands on my stomach and they were all crying because they had all seen what i went through and i was alive and i think they all prayed for me together so yeah that was uh, that was so emotional when they were all over there and uh, i think i'm alive today because of the amazing care i got that day in the night if even one of them they didn't even leave my side for like a minute through that 15 hours they were just there trying to ensure that i live somehow or anyhow now i came back home and uh, i was like any other mother who had given birth i was lactating and i had milk and it would just flow and i didn't know what to do and i was emotional and hormonal and uh, again people were coming home with flowers and you know were so sorry to hear what happened and i had just given up at that time i was like it's not even worth living anymore and why am i here so uh, i very later on found out that one of the babies was a baby boy and uh, my my mother was the only one who had seen it because she was there with me during the delivery and uh, they didn't let my husband in and it was so sad because he was telling me he could see me from far away through the curtain and they wouldn't let him in because he's the next of kin and if he were to see something that happened to me that he would never be able to forget and so he was telling me like i could see you there i could see you crying i could see the blood but i couldn't be there and um, i got i became severely severely depressed and um, it's funny that i'm talking about it today because uh, yeah it's I, crazy that <laughs> i trust me my heart is so heavy right now i can i'm i may explode any time hearing your story this is something so I, um, like dushman ko bhi nahi hona chahiye you know it's like it's really really painful and that's why i told you my story is epic <laughs> today i am able to sit today and hold back my tears and talk about it but there was a time when i could not talk about it and i be- it became so bad for me that i thought i was jinxed because if we moved to some house my neighbor got pregnant everybody around me was getting pregnant it was like i had this powerful miraculous aura around me where if i was around somebody they got pregnant but i would never get pregnant like they would tell me after like three weeks after they had spent time with me that hey you know what i'm carrying without knowing my story so it would hurt so much inside that i would always be like why is this 
why is this happening to me right and um, i would keep crying to my mother and i'm like when am i going to tell somebody that i'm pregnant you know i have been in other people's labor rooms i have uh, decorated their houses for them when they brought their babies and came i used to like put balloons and streamers and bake cakes because i knew that the babies were coming and you know hold baby showers for them because everybody around me was getting pregnant and so i have this very close friend who said you know what maybe you're just lucky for them that being around you is you know something that is very good and why don't you look at it like that you have that power and at that time i wouldn't understand that because i would cry and i'm like i don't want that power for other people i want that for myself and so i stopped um i stopped going to like birthday parties i stopped going out because every time i saw a pregnant woman my eyes would go to her stomach and then i would be like if i looked at her something would happen to her and i would jinx it for her and so i stopped going out i started to like become a recluse i stopped painting i wrapped up everything and it came to a point when one day we were in whitefield and we were looking at changing our car and we were in the volkswagen showroom there so all these car showrooms they have this shaft where they bring the cars up these are like three four floors i kid you not sana i was at the edge of the shaft i was ready to jump very blankly went and stood on the edge in my brain it was like i am not able to give my husband what he wants he can be a father it is not his fault i am my body is not able to carry what he we as a couple want and so if i were not in this picture he can marry again and have children and i was 2 seconds away from jumping and he turned behind and looked at me to ask me how this car was and he saw me there and he called out to me so i turned and i started crying very loudly so he said what were you doing over there and i said i was going to jump and so we got out of the showroom we went to the terrace of the building and i cried and cried and cried and i told him you know what i don't think i want to live anymore because this is to me at that point of time in my head it felt like the the only reason you should be alive is because your womb defines you as a woman you should be able to carry children you should be able to have children and for me that was like the ultimate goal like if i was not able to get pregnant and if i was not able to have children then this is not worth living and when he saw that this had happened to me and he saw what was happening to me mentally he, he was the one who opened the laptop one day and said you know what we want to build our family and want our children let's just adopt and if this works out it works out others will just be a couple that doesn't have children and there are a lot of couples like that and they move on with their lives and they plan their retirement and they go on holidays and i was not okay with that like i would take even like like a a, a tortoise from the road and be, be maternal to it like that that feeling was so overwhelming for me that maternal feeling right and even now my friends call me like a ma- mother hen so um he was the one who started this whole process of the application of uh, applying on kara and uh, this was 2016 so all this uh, idf saga that had happened was 2015 so 2016 is when we applied no you know this feeling of it's so so much you know common in women like this feeling of someone should call me ma there is no one else who will call you ma like your child will call you ma i will never judge you if you take the fertility route path but i also feel like it, don't torture yourself for this correct it's I, not worth it what is the point if you have your babies but you are not alive or you have your babies or after 10 years you have some deadly disease because of the drugs you put in your system Absolutely. what's the point you try once you give science a, a choice you try a second time but if it doesn't happen after that don't keep doing this because you're financially able to do it don't torture your body because i tell people very crudely for a man it's about giving his sperm in a cup 
but for women it's about so much torture of injections and embryo transfers and this retrieval and that retrieval going crazy behind the getting ivf then i have known people who have done six times seven times i'm like i have a friend who's done it 15 times ana 15 times and because it didn't work after that they went in for surrogacy and then they had a baby through surrogacy and yet when they talk about adoption they will hush their voice and say oh your baby is adopted and yeah. i always tell them can you raise your voice and say that because i am very proud of it and why are you not absolutely because there is it's not taboo you chose to build your family through artificial methods i chose to build my family by bringing my heart out of my body and giving it to somebody else 